Hello everyone. I want to welcome you to our introduction to our study of the book of Luke. We are so excited about this. It's actually going to stretch out for the next 11 or 12 weeks, potentially ending the week after Easter. Our goal was that we would start at the birth of Jesus and go all the way through the resurrection just in time for Easter. So I'm excited as we jump into this. But we were going to meet in person this week and unfortunately a few of our staff got positive COVID tests. So we just thought for everyone's safety, it would be better to go virtual. So I'm gonna do just a little introductory video just to get us all on the same page, to get us reading together this week. And I really wish, if I'm being honest, that my sister Heather were here with me. Um, she is so much fun and we have agreed to partner together to teach. She'll take a week, I'll take a week. Um, but unfortunately, she is one of the ones that do not feel re well right now. So we're gonna pray for her. Um, and give her a shout out. If you know her personally, send her a text and encourage her. Um, Heather, we just want you to know we are praying for you and we are covering you. In fact, we're gonna pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, we lift up Heather and all who are sick right now, everyone who is struggling with COVID or any other sickness. Father, we recognize that you are the Lord who heals us. So we just pray recovery and health over everyone who is sick right now, Father. We ask for miraculous recoveries. We ask for medical interventions. We just ask, Lord God, that you would help our people's immune systems kick in and to beat this virus or any other sickness they are struggling with. And we will give you all glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we jump into this, I just wanted to give us all some thoughts as we are reading the scriptures together this week. You know, Jesus said this, he was talking to the Pharisees, and this is something that's important for us to learn because the Pharisees were considered the experts in the Bible of their day. They knew a lot of scripture. And this is what Jesus said to them in John chapter five. He said, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. But these are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. In other words, Jesus is saying, you're diligent in your study and you think that in the scripture, you're gonna find eternal life, but you have missed the point. The eternal life is not in the scripture itself. It is in the one the scripture is talking about. And Jesus was saying, these scriptures are talking about me, but you have to go one step further and come to me to have life. I was thinking about that verse as I was preparing for this and really praying for you guys and all that God will do with this study. Because it's frustrating to me to realize that you could be diligent in studying the word and yet walk away unchanged, not transformed, as if you just read any other book. And I believe what Jesus is saying to us is that we have to remember all scripture, the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, the Psalms, they were all pointing to one person, Jesus. All scripture leads us to him. So it's important that we are not trying to just gain a bunch of knowledge about Jesus because knowledge is not where our transformation comes. Nearness is where we are transformed. So I just wanna encourage you to not let this just be a mental exercise, but to intentionally draw near to the Spirit of God as you are reading the Word. So the way I do it is when I sit down to study, I pray this simple prayer every single time. I pray, Lord, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. A psalmist wrote that in Psalms 119, and Jesus even echoed it. It says in Luke 24 that Jesus opened his disciples' eyes so that they could understand the scriptures. It's important to remember that we may feel like we are unable to be a Bible scholar, or we don't have all the training someone else has. Maybe we didn't grow up in church all of our lives. But God says that if we will just come to him, he will start opening our eyes so that we can see the truth. In fact, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit, one of his roles in our lives is to guide us into all truth. that he is our guide as we read, which means we're not reading alone. So I just wanna invite you, as you are reading this week, Luke chapters one and two, just to, to make it conversational with the Holy Spirit and talk to him as you are reading. If you hit a dry place, something, nothing is jumping out, just ask him to reveal the wonderful things you may be missing. 
So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to pray. And then the next thing as we are reading is we are going to look. We just asked the Holy Spirit to help us. So I just want you to pay attention. What is it you're seeing as you read? What observations are you making? What's standing out? What's jumping off the page at you? What maybe you don't understand? Or what is actually worthy of a praise break? There are times where I'm reading scripture and something is blowing my mind. And I just stop, I put my hands in the air and I worship God in that moment. So I wanna encourage you, remember this is not an educational exercise. It's a relational time between you and the Father. I just wanna encourage you to draw near to him. So for those of you who are not natural question askers, don't worry, I got you. I have written down a few questions that you can ask when you are reading, just that the Holy Spirit might show you what the text is saying and what he is speaking to you. So the first question is, who is the scripture about and what is happening? Hopefully that one is simple. If we can't identify those two, we maybe need to go back to the beginning, but hopefully we can tell who it's about and what is happening. The second question is, what is new, surprising, or unexpected? I have learned that as I ask the Lord to open my eyes, that oftentimes even something I've read before, even a story I'm familiar with, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit will start highlighting new things to me, things I never expected to see, even in something I'm very familiar with. Number three, what other scriptures does this connect to? It's so important to realize that all of scripture is one cohesive book. It is God's story of his intervention into humanity through his son, Jesus. He began sharing truths about his son that would come one day to save us hundreds of years before Jesus ever came. So when Jesus came, we're going to begin discovering this next week. He began fulfilling specific words that had been spoken about him hundreds of years before in the law, in the prophets, and in the Psalms. And so sometimes when I'm reading, I may not fully understand what the text is saying right there, but I will notice a cross-reference. If you're reading a physical Bible, cross-reference notes are usually at the bottom. If you are reading online, like on BibleGateway.com, you can turn on the uh, notifications so you can actually see the cross-reference notes. And a lot of times I'll go back and read, where was this talked about before in scripture? And it will help me understand where I'm at right there. And then the fourth question, what do I need help understanding? There's so much in the Bible that's not in our culture, names that are not familiar, words we may not understand. So I wanna give you two resources if you've never used these before. I just mentioned BibleGateway.com. That resource, it's an online search engine, really. You can put any scripture in and it will pull up any scripture in any translation that you want to read in. One of my favorite things that it does is if you just look up one scripture at a time, there's a link that will show up below and it will say that you can click on it and see that one scripture in all English translations. So sometimes I like to see how a different translation would word something. Something will jump out at me if I can compare the different ways that words have been expressed in the Bible. And then the other one I really like is blueletterbible.org, blueletterbible.org, not .com. This one is great if you want to see what the original meaning of the words you are reading are in the original Greek for New Testament or original Hebrew in the Old Testament. This is my favorite place. You just literally put the word in, into the search bar, and you hit enter, and it will pull up every verse that word appears in the scripture. And then there's one little box at the top you have to check. It's called Strong's. It's just gonna take you to Strong's Concordance. And if you check that box, and then click on the number right beside that word, you will begin to see the original word, the original pronunciation, the meaning, every place that word shows up in scripture. And there's so many times when I'm like, what does this mean? I'm sure there's something more to this than I'm getting. I will do a quick word study or a word search and God will begin to open my eyes to the layers of meaning below that I couldn't see before. So I just encourage you to try it. So we're gonna pray, then we're gonna look and then we're gonna listen. Listen is where we simply ask the Holy Spirit, what does this mean? What does the text mean in and of itself for all people, for all of time, what does it mean? And what does it mean for me right now, right where I'm at? I don't know about you, but every time I read scripture, 
it doesn't matter where I'm at in the Bible. The Bible says that all of Scripture is beneficial. It's profitable for teaching, for correction, for training, for guidance. So anytime I get into the Word, I am looking for something God is going to use to speak to me directly where I am at right in that moment. And so I want to encourage you as you are reading these stories, don't just stay separated from them. But as you're reading about these people, I want you to think things like, can I relate with them? Would I have the faith they had in that situation? Or would I have doubted the way they doubted in that situation? And how does God respond to them? And how can I trust that he will respond to me? So we're going to pray, look, listen. The fourth thing is obey. We're going to obey. I want to encourage you to ask God every week, what is a challenge you want me to obey from what I read just now? Jesus was teaching and he was trying to explain to people that all the different types of people that hear the word of God fall into two categories. They can choose to build their house, which is a metaphor for their life, on one of two foundations. They can choose to build on sand or they can choose to build on rock. The difference in the foundation is simple. When the storm comes, the one built on the sand is going to quickly crumble, crumble. But the one built on the rock will be able to withstand the storm. And I've watched so many storms over this past year in so many people's lives. And I have watched people's lives crumble. And Jesus is saying the difference in the two foundations The group who built on the sand, they are the ones who heard my word and did not obey. But the ones who heard my word and then obeyed and put it into practice, they have built their lives on the rock. And when the storms come and they may come one right after another, they will have the strength to stand. So I am believing as we dive into the word of God, that God is building the strength to stand on the inside of us. And it's not gonna be based on our head knowledge of Jesus. It's gonna be based on our nearness and our obedience to him. So I encourage you, as God challenges you, as you read these stories, what is he asking you to obey? Can you take a bold step of faith this week to obey what he has said? And then the last thing, we're gonna pray, look, listen, obey, and share. What is a truth from what you are reading right here that God wants you to stand on and to share with someone else? You know, as believers, we were never meant to be people that contain what God is pouring into us. Whether it's wealth or blessing or wisdom, we are meant to be vessels that God can freely flow through. So as he's pouring truth into us, he wants to pour truth out of us. And you and I, all of us who have placed faith in the name of Jesus, have been commissioned as evangelists to go forth and share the good news of Jesus. So I want to encourage you as you're learning the good news of Jesus, we're going to hear a lot of good news about him. We're going to hear the good news in his birth. We're going to hear the good news in his miracles and his teaching and his moments with people. We're going to hear the good news in his death and resurrection. But every week I want to challenge you to take a step and share something that God is showing you with someone else. Because we have such a treasure that people in the world are looking for. They don't know the way, the truth, and the life the way we know him. They don't know the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Maybe their foundation is on sand and God is ready to move it to a foundation of rock. So can I encourage you? We are not just going to be bold to obey, but we are going to be bold to share what God is showing us each week. And then the last thing I want to share with you is just a few fun facts about Luke as we jump into this. I don't know about you, but context always helps me. And I just want you to know, as I've been studying about Luke, he is a fascinating man. Okay, he was considered a Gentile Christian, which just means a Gentile is someone who is not of the nation of Israel. They are not a Jew, which means he came to faith from someone sharing the gospel with him after Jesus's resurrection. So he was not one of the disciples that walked with Jesus day in and day out. But he was a physician. That means he was a doctor. So he's very educated medically. And he also became a traveling companion with Paul. He partnered with him in a lot of his missionary journeys. And he used his physician trade to help support some of their journeys. So he was also a disciple of Paul. 
And then Luke took it upon himself. He wanted to create an account where he gathered all of these eyewitness testimonies of Jesus's life from birth to ascension and compiled it in a document that would go before some of the most educated Gentiles of the day. So he wrote in a, in a level of Greek no one else had written. He was the only Gentile writer in all of scripture. That's amazing. And he wrote it in such a way that people would realize he had conducted a historical investigation. He had gone back to person after person to verify the truth of what they were saying Jesus did and what he said and how he lived. He wanted people to know he's not a fairy tale. Jesus is not just some social icon that had his moment in the sun and now he is no more. He wanted people to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was who he said he was. He is truly the savior of the world. So he went to great lengths to support all of his study. Another fun fact about Luke you may not know is church tradition says that he was also a painter. They say that he may have painted several different scenes that are depicted throughout the gospels. In fact, they think he may have painted one of the very first pictures of Mary, the mother of Jesus, with Jesus as her baby, the Madonna and Christ child pictures that we see a lot in the Catholic church. He may have been one of the first artists to paint that, which I think is really cool. A few more things about Luke is he didn't just write Luke, he wrote the book of Acts. And he wrote both of these books to be one work. They were not supposed to be split up. They were supposed to be one work. Luke is the longest gospel of the four. And Luke and Acts combined is over a fourth of the New Testament writing. So Luke wrote more of the New Testament than Paul even did. He contributed more of the New Testament than any other writer. So he's very significant. Luke was very thorough. He included so many details that a few of the other gospel writers did not include. So I'm so excited as we jump into this. And a couple more things that you may wanna know. You'll realize as you read the beginning of Luke, he addresses his letter to someone named Theophilus. He calls him most excellent Theophilus. Most excellent was um, a description that you only applied to people of nobility. So most people think that he wrote Luke and Acts to give it to someone who was in a governmental position or a very influential citizen. Some people think Theophilus was his patron, a person who financially supported him to get this published. Other people think, and this is actually a theory that a that's growing in popularity right now, that Luke compiled Luke and Acts, that it could become part of Paul's defense when he went to stand trial in Rome. Because he was on trial in Rome for his claims about Jesus. And so a lot of people think the way that Acts ended, it ends abruptly right before Paul's trial, that this was part of Paul's defense that would actually be read before the courtroom, which would explain why it was written in such high Greek. It would explain why it was so educated and detailed in making sure that it was firsthand eyewitness accounts. So I hope some of those thoughts help you as we launch into our study of Luke this very next week, chapters one and two. You know, if you need to set the mood, you're gonna be reading the birth story of Jesus. Go ahead and make um, some apple cider or hot cocoa. You know, get yourself in the Christmas spirit and we're gonna dive in and see what God shows us. I can't wait to be with you all, uh, with you all next week. A lot of talking, sorry. Okay, that's all we have, bye-bye.